Last year marked my 30-year high school reunion. We had a gathering on Zoom. One of the things that struck me was how many of my former classmates have enjoyed remarkable material success in the corporate and business worlds. It got me thinking that if I had stayed the course I initially set out on from school to become a barrister, today I would be a senior lawyer with 25 years experience and all the material trappings to go with it. It's not a thought I entertain often because dwelling on it is unhelpful. Now, here's the thing. By global standards, I am wealthy, very wealthy in fact, but I don't feel wealthy, certainly not among my peers, and that perception is much more powerful living in Melbourne now than it was when I lived as a missionary in Mexico City and was objectively far less wealthy. Living in a materialistic culture messes with my mind. Do you find that? One of the besetting sins of the middle class and the wealthy is to compare up. The sin of greed is not the exclusive prerogative of rich people, but there is an acquisitive, addictive danger to having money and possessions. The more you have, the more you feel dissatisfied with what you have and covet what others have. How much is enough? A little more. Always a little more. By contrast, the Apostle Paul writes that godliness with contentment is great gain. Today we turn to another challenging topic in the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus teaches on the theme of wealth. The rest of Matthew chapter 6 addresses the topic. Next week, Jeremiah will tell you why you should not worry about money and possessions. This week, I'll tell you why you should. The reason is this. A wrong perspective on wealth can bring spiritual ruin. When did you last hear someone confess to struggling with greed? Greed is a socially acceptable sin for first world Christianity, but it is a deadly sin, and Jesus calls us beyond greed. Jesus' antidote to the poison of greed comes in three exhortations. Each one presents a contrast between two kinds of treasure, two kinds of vision, and two kinds of master. First, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why not? Because earthly possessions do not last. They can be eaten away over time or taken away in an instant. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why not? because there is a better alternative. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, treasures that last, free from moths and vermin, rot and rust, the slow decay of time and the sudden loss of theft or financial disaster. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why not? Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What you value most will be what you worship. What you cherish most dearly will control your life. John Calvin wrote, If honour is rated the highest good, then ambition must take complete charge of a person. If money, then forthwith greed takes over the kingdom. If pleasure, then people will certainly degenerate into sheer self-indulgence. 
We bought a new car last year because the old one was no longer worth repairing. I loved driving around, enjoying the upgraded features, savouring the new car smell, the spotless interior and the gleaming Juco. Then one day, in a minor car park incident, a rear reflector was broken and it irked me. I was really grumpy. What does that say about the state of my heart? Where is your treasure? There your heart will be also. So Jesus says, cherish God, treasure the things of eternity, live for the kingdom of heaven. This is not a commitment of wizened duty, but a priority of wholehearted delight. Later in Matthew, Jesus tells this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. We understand how to store up treasures on earth. How do we store up treasures in heaven? We do it by using our money and possessions strategically and sacrificially to serve others in love and to advance God's kingdom priorities. Love for others and kingdom priorities are the keys. The Bible does not forbid having possessions. God's word encourages us to enjoy the good things of life. Scripture commends saving for the future. Wealth creation is a God-given ability. And the Bible encourages us to share wealth, which requires creating it. But hoarding wealth is condemned as selfish, short-sighted, and spiritually disastrous. The second part of Jesus' antidote to greed is to have healthy vision. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Jesus is not giving a lesson in ophthalmology. The last sentence shows that his point about healthy eyes is a moral one, not a physiological one. The eye is the lamp of the body in the sense that the body finds its way through the eye, morally as well as physically. The way you look at the external world can fill your internal world with light or with darkness. And the darkness within is deepest when we think we look at the world with healthy eyes, but in fact do not. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Verses 22 and 23 seem out of place in a section of teaching about money and possessions, don't they? A subtle wordplay explains why they are here. The Greek word that the NIV translates as healthy can mean generous. And the Greek word that the NIV translates as unhealthy can mean stingy, envious, covetous. An example from Matthew 20 may help. There Jesus tells the parable of the workers in the vineyard. A landowner hired workers who agreed to work from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. for a denarius, a day's wage. Then he hired other workers at 9 a.m., others at 12 p.m., and even some at 5 p.m. At the end of the day, he gave them each the same pay, a denarius. The workers who had worked all day grumbled about this, understandably. Listen to what happened next. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. 
Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? The point of the parable is that what determines standing in the kingdom of heaven is not our personal merit, but God's generous grace. That last question, or are you envious because I am generous, could be translated more woodenly, or is your eye bad because I am good? Are you starting to see what Jesus means here by healthy and unhealthy eyes? John Piper captures the sense of a bad eye. It refers to an eye that cannot see the beauty of grace. It cannot see the brightness of generosity. It cannot see unexpected blessing to others as a precious treasure. It is an eye that is blind to what is truly beautiful and bright and precious and godlike. It is a worldly eye. It sees money and material reward as more to be desired than a beautiful display of free, gracious, godlike generosity. One implication of these verses is that generosity towards others is a litmus test of whether we have a healthy vision of wealth. John Wesley famously said in a sermon about the use of money, gain all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Without the third, the first two amount to unadulterated greed. Gain all you can, save all you can, give all you can. For our Lenten Bible study series this year, we are looking at the Generosity Project. It's an opportunity to learn, pray and work together to become the big-hearted people God calls us to be, to give ourselves to others as God gives himself to us in the Gospel. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Have a healthy vision. The third part of Jesus' antidote to greed is to serve one master. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Have you heard the saying by English philosopher Francis Bacon that money is a great servant but a bad master? There is truth in it, but that is not quite Jesus' point here. He uses the language of slaves and masters not to ask whether money will serve you or master you, but to ask whether you will serve God or money. You will be the servant, but who will be the master? Have you ever worked multiple part-time jobs at the same time? I've done that at a couple of stages in my life. It can be complicated, but it's possible. Jesus uses the language of slaves, not employees, of course. In the world of the New Testament, it was technically possible for a slave to have multiple masters. Jesus' point, however, is that being a Christian is full-time. It's about belonging to God completely serving him wholeheartedly and exclusively. In terms of your ultimate allegiance, you cannot serve two masters. In particular, you cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve God on Sunday and money on Monday. You cannot serve both God and money, not least because they pull in opposite directions. Serving money pulls you into self-centred living. Serving God pulls you into serving others. If you try to serve both masters, Jesus says, you will hate one and love the other, or 
be devoted to one and despise the other. The great danger, of course, at the end of the day, is that if you serve money, you will hate God. If you are devoted to money, you will despise God. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, treasures that will last. Have a healthy vision of money and possessions, one that sees and savours God's generosity and shows generosity to others. You must serve one master, God or money. So choose wisely.